every Sunday and located at 646 East Buena Vista Avenue in North Augusta. Live from Augusta, you're watching News 12, live at 5. Augusta Tech is making some major plans for the future of its students. Just ahead, how it's working to transform into a destination campus. But first, we've had a nice rainy day today. Yuck, it sounds like we have more of this stuff on the way tomorrow. Yeah, we'll head over to First Alert Chief Meteorologist Riley Hill. And Riley, how much rain do we get today and how much more can we expect here? Very impressive rain totals so far today. We've actually picked up over three inches at both Daniel and Bushfield. So both airports today in town have now received the second highest amount of rainfall for this date in recorded history. Now the very first uh, top spot for the most rain on this date actually goes back to 1990. Some of our viewers may remember this significant flooding event. During this day we actually did have close to 20 inches of rain that fell just outside of Louisville and Jefferson County. This actually led to Race Creek flooding and washed out a good portion of Amon Corner, uh, knocking out the complete uh, portion of the 11th Green. And then the, uh, we had four fatalities. Unfortunately, a federal disaster Disaster was declared for our area and led to over $150 million in damage. So I know a lot of our viewers probably remember that date. Uh, luckily, our rain is ending for the rest of this evening and two tonight, and we did dodge the severe weather threat. We had a lot of severe weather reports across the peninsula of Florida with that system. For us here, a little more zoomed in view, you can see we're drying out across the area and looking much better for the rest of tonight. Now, tomorrow, make sure you have the umbrella again. We're expecting on and off showers all day long Friday, but it will improve by the weekend. We'll have that Full forecast in just a bit. Let's get a quick update on your first alert traffic. And now, first alert traffic. Here's a live look at I-20. This is looking eastbound down I-20 towards the Savannah River. And you can see that traffic may be a little congested, a little bit slower than normal. Uh, but overall, weather could be impacting you. Definitely some slick roadways out there. We'll have an update on the rest of the forecast for you in just about 10 minutes. All right, thanks, Riley. Leaders at Augusta Tech are pushing to transform the campus into a destination school. In May, we told you about some of these new programs that they have. The state-of-the-art classes are putting the school in the spotlight so much they've seen a major increase in their enrollment. But with all this expansion and a growing student body, President Jermaine Worrell says they are still missing one thing. Our Hallie Turner tells us the next steps they're taking to continue on the motto of a destination campus. Augusta Tech has always been a place where you come to class and then you leave. But with a growing student population and hundreds driving from out of the area, Dr. Jermaine Worrell says the one thing they're missing is student housing, which they're hoping to build right here behind me on the Augusta campus. The push for student housing came this year with a boost in enrollment close to 9% from last year. Dr. Worrell says nearly 6,000 students are enrolled at a two-year school and 11% of them are coming from as far as Atlanta to Edgefield, South Carolina and are driving this four days a week. With no option now for housing, Worrell says it takes away from a college experience they want to give students. And the next step in making this place a destination is a place where their students can rest and find community. What they don't want to give up is the college experience. So they want to still be able to live on campus, you know, have that res life experience. And so we felt that we already have the curriculum, we have the programs, if we can match up with housing, then we feel like this is going to be a destination that students will want to really come and, and be a part of. But coming up all new tonight on News 12 at 6 o'clock, we're giving you more details into what the space behind me could turn into and how students feel their experience will change. All right, thanks for that, Hallie. A woman accused of stabbing three people, including an officer, appearing in court this morning. It was a chaotic scene at the Hartsfield-Jackson International Airport in Atlanta yesterday evening after authorities say the woman went on a stabbing spree. It's all happening in the unsecured area of the South Terminal. Now, authorities say a 44-year-old woman had a knife at the security checkpoint while trying to restrain the suspect. Authorities say she stabbed a woman, then stabbed a police officer before she was detained. Later, it was determined she also allegedly stabbed her taxi driver who brought her to the airport. The civilians that were stabbed are in stable condition. The Atlanta police lieutenant is also in stable condition. All three have been taken to Brady Hospital.
The officer stabbed is now out of the hospital and recovering. The other two victims' injuries are not considered life-threatening. The suspect is charged with four counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. No word on what the motive is behind these stabbings. A seventh suspect has been identified in the case of an alleged cult that starved and beat a woman to death. In September, six people from a religious group called Soldiers of Christ were arrested after a body was found in the trunk of a vehicle. Investigators say the deceased victim was from South Korea and was lured to the U.S. to join the religious organization. Now, it's believed the victim was beaten and starved for weeks before she died. Now, one of the suspects in this investigation says he is actually a victim, and he was tortured right alongside the woman who died. Is a victim in this case. Uh, he was also kept in that basement with Miss Cho, the deceased. Uh, he was down there for many weeks, also um, denied food, um, and he was beaten very badly um, with a whip. Uh, he was stripped naked, uh, beaten about his genitals, and then they shot him with an airsoft gun uh, in his arms and his back. A judge granting bond for this suspect under the condition he wears an ankle monitor and live with family. The investigation into the Church of Christ continues tonight. Charges for six Fulton County deputies could be reinstated after a decision by the Georgia Supreme Court. Back in 2018, Antonio May was arrested on a misdemeanor trespassing charge. While being booked into the Fulton County Jail, indictments say six jailers reportedly beat, pepper sprayed, and choked May with a taser, causing his death. Now, the attorneys for the guards said they should have been able to share their side of the story before the indictments were handed up. Now, a lower court initially agreed and throughout the indictment, Yesterday, the state Supreme Court reversed that decision, which means indictments are back on the table. An attorney for May's family says the guards will be charged with murder. She gave out a big sigh of relief. She said, thank you, Jesus. She said, I knew something was not right when this case got thrown out. And she said, I felt like they had not been held responsible. At this time, the six jailers have not been indicted. The Fulton County Jail is currently under investigation by the Department of Justice for its use of force, mental health care, and other issues. A massive community effort is underway in Bullock County, Georgia tonight after one of the largest dog hoarding situations that area has ever seen. 193 animals were found around one property, primarily dogs. The owner suffered a medical emergency and first responders notice just how many animals there were the owner later died now authorities are working with the late owner's family to get things in order animal control says this is an unsanitary hoarding situation but they say it's not an abusive one most of the dogs were described as healthy and well fed but some needed more intensive care the county shelter had to team up with several local rescues because any one group simply did not have the capacity to take in nearly 200 dogs. This is so many dogs. Like, I don't think I've ever seen this many dogs in one place. One of the main groups that took in animals, Renegade Paws and Rescue, has more information on those rescue dogs who will be up for adoption. The head of South Carolina's prison system says he might finally have an answer to what he calls the top public safety concern facing South Carolinians. It's one we've reported on for years. Illegal cell phones being snuck behind bars and in inmates' hands, fueling dangerous crime. Our State House reporter Mary Green explains what this fix could be. South Carolina is the first state in the nation to implement a pilot program that allows them to work with cell phone carriers to disable illegal cell phones inside prisons. It's worked so well in one prison that now the Department of Corrections wants to put it in all of them. With technology, these folks are able to reach out and hurt people on the outside. Um, and I think we have a solution. The Department of Corrections has been testing this pilot program at Lee Correctional Institution in Bishopville since late July. Since then, it reports nearly 800 phones have been identified and disabled in a prison with just over a thousand inmates. 
Meanwhile, the number of monitored calls dialed on the phones the prison provides has gone up 57 percent. Another sign to Corrections Director Brian Sterling that this is working. Sterling told a panel of lawmakers this week that inmates use contraband cell phones to coordinate crime from behind prison walls, making South Carolinians less safe. These crimes leave lifelong impacts for people like Robert Johnson, a former corrections officer shot six times in a hit he says was ordered by a locked up gang leader. I'm here to tell you there's no recovery of this type of shooting. I'm here to encourage you to give the Department of Corrections as much help as possible so that no one, absolutely no one, goes through what I've gone through in the last 13 years. Sterling plans to ask the General Assembly for money in next year's budget to implement this in all state prisons. They're still determining the exact amount, but the Department of Corrections says it'll be a multi-million dollar request. Reporting from the State House, I'm Mary Green. Sterling says he still believes the best solution is to block cell phone signals in prison, something he's been trying to do for years. And chances are this pilot program, it could see some success in our area. The Charles B. Webster Jail has seen its fair share of contraband issues. This year alone, at least four Richmond County jailers have been charged with bringing contraband, like cell phones, inside the jail for inmates. Well, former Israeli soldiers who now... For the rest of this evening, but more rain than the forecast tomorrow, but luckily drying out this weekend. We'll have a full look at it just after break. Time and temp. Welcome back, folks. A beautiful view down the Savannah River. A little bit cloudy still out there, but luckily we are drier than what we've been so far today. So if you have any plans to step out this evening, we got some great high school football games going on tonight. Take the towel to wipe off the bleachers, but luckily we're just not expecting much in the way of rainfall as we continue into this evening and early tonight. This is a long 18-hour loop of all that steady rain that we start uh, that we started to see yesterday. Yesterday, around this time frame, the rain started. It just started to let up a couple of hours ago, so close to 18 hours straight of rain for us here across the region. Much drier, closer look at the region. You can see our rain chances are going to be pretty slim the next several hours. I would say less than 15% before midnight, so not expecting much rain out there. Different story, though, tomorrow. Heading out to the bus stop, definitely have the rain gear with you. We are expecting the chance for a few showers starting early tomorrow morning, lasting through the afternoon, and most likely even keeping around portions of our Friday evening and Friday night. An additional quarter inch, maybe close to a half inch of rainfall expected tomorrow, so not as significant as what we've seen over the last day, but uh, definitely still enough to cause some nuisance issues for you. Here's a look at it on our hour by hour. So this evening, once again, mostly dry, unless you're getting closer to I-16. So if you live in, say, Wrightsville or Swainsboro, maybe a stray shower this evening. Drive for us here in Augusta. Once we get to tomorrow morning, waking up upper 50s, low 60s. That rain will be building in from the south and just lifting north. Uh, not expecting it to be too heavy. So uh, minimal impacts as far as uh, uh, any major concerns with this, not really expecting uh, any severe weather threat, no uh, thunderstorm threat, just generic, very light showers that will be hit or miss throughout the day on Friday. Luckily, these do clear out by the weekend, so Saturday morning we're going to see a front arrive, and that's really going to push these showers east of us. Should see clearing skies by Saturday afternoon. That will be good news for us to check out the partial solar eclipse that is going to be heading our way on Saturday. And if you want to know how to check it out, you can use our First Alert weather app. Just post a video there with all the information. Friday, we got temperatures staying in the 50s and 60s all day long. Those chance for, uh, chance for showers will be with us all day long as well. Luckily, Saturday, much drier. Temps will actually get a little bit warm in the afternoon, close to 80 degrees. It will be a little bit breezy, though, behind that front. We could see some wind gusts possibly up to around 20 miles an hour. Once we get past that early morning rain threat Saturday, it does dry out Saturday through early next week. And even all the way through next Thursday, there is not much rain in our forecast. So it's really just tomorrow, maybe a quick early shower before sunrise Saturday. That's what that 20% is really highlighting. Don't cancel anything. If you're up after sunrise Saturday, you're not going to see any rainfall. Sunday, we're expecting that sun to return, and those high temperatures look to be below average, most likely into the low 70s. Getting even cooler, though, once we get past the weekend, we actually have highs dropping into the mid-60s next Monday and Tuesday and some chilly mornings down into the 40s. All right, thanks, Riley. Two former Israeli soldiers who now... ...list about to Pixent. As little as two weeks, Dupixit is an add-on treatment for specific...
with types of moderate to severe asthma that's not for sudden breathing problems. Dupixent can cause allergic reactions that can be severe. Get help right away if you have rash, chest pain, worsening shortness of breath, tingling or numbness in your limbs. Tell your doctor about new or worsening joint aches and pain or a parasitic infection. Don't change or stop asthma medicines, including steroids, without talking to your doctor. Ask your specialist about Dupixent. live look at I-20 just outside of our building. You can see very slow moving traffic in this eastbound lane. So a heads up if you're crossing the state line. Luckily, we're mostly dry at the moment. We've uh, luckily a lot drier than what we were to start off the day, but temperatures are still well below average. We're only seeing high temps in the mid 60s so far this afternoon. Closer look at our radar network. You can still see we have the cloud cover with us, but not much reflectivity on our radar network. So I would say uh, most spots are dry outside of maybe a very light uh, mist that the radar is possibly missing. But for tonight, we are going to stay mostly dry. Heading into our Friday morning, the rain chances do come back into play. So make sure you have the umbrella with you for that morning commute. We'll keep the opportunity for a few hit and miss showers through lunchtime, the afternoon, even portions of our Friday evening. So definitely could impact those games tomorrow. And also the start of the fair, unfortunately, doesn't look great for Friday. Luckily, the fair looks great for the weekend. Saturday and Sunday, we're looking dry and temperatures not too bad each afternoon. All right, thanks, Riley. Stick with us. We have more news, weather, and sports coming up after a short break as News 12 Live at 5 continues.